favorites. So I'm going to start with you, Mark. You've been dormant for a while. <laughs> so I mean, you Thursday. work with you work with a lot of companies. <laughs> Thursday, those stories. It happens. That's good stories. Yeah. So you work with a lot of companies. You collaborated. What do you think is like one of the most valuable things that you've seen the companies can start with in terms of really affecting their, their sustainability? Great question. Um, I, I would distill it down to defining sustainability for the company's culture. You, you have a corporate nomenclature. Every company has their value system, their, their mission, their vision, right? But you need to uh, internalize what does sustainable development mean. So those economic, social, environmental pieces need to come together and have a definition. So you have to create a point of view. How do we see, whether I'm a company that's manufacturing apparel or I'm generating oil and gas and oil energy production or um, the spirits? I mean, everyone has a perspective, right? So that's the starting point. Uh, I think uh, the other side of that coin would be leadership commitment. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my time in the C-suite translating the technical into the business. And uh, when you get into the sort of corporate romper room, you have you know, the primary colors and the simple charts. But uh, I jest, but we need to understand that, that tied to that framework of language, that definition of sustainability, that the executives can view their business through that lens because they're managing risk at the level of executives and officers in the corporation, it's enterprise risk management. So oftentimes they're looking at what is the risk, what's the bandwidth below and above. So you can invert risk and opportunity and you can capitalize on that because we see now that we can quantify it. So definition and leadership. Great, thanks. Yeah, I was just at the uh, Sustainable Brands Conference. Mark was there as well. Someone actually asked us to define sustainability. And I was a little, the panelist, which he asked, was taken aback. He was actually pissed that he was asked that question. I think because he was asked it so many times that he thought it was like ridiculous. But in a branding and marketing conference, I think it actually does have a place. There's a lot of different definitions. To me, it's about doing less, doing more with less. And it gets to the heart of profitability. And what we love doing is making the business case because it goes right to the investment community. So we really don't talk about green per se, we talk about the triple bottom line, but mainly the bottom line and increase in shareholder return. If I could just add a, a, an anecdotal point to that, if you recall back when the internet was new and Al Gore formed it, remember the little E in front of everything, e-commerce, the small E, right? Well, you see that today in sort of the small S. And I would posit that in five years or so, that sustainability will just fall away into this is business 101, this is how we view business. And I think that's where we've, we've passed the tipping point, regardless of policy and carbon. The markets are pulling through, the consumers are responding, and it's driving innovation. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to see that take traction much deeper across all these sectors and see the wonderful products come along that. Roberta, uh, I loved your example on the Captain Morgan, the distillery. So in terms of what Diageo is doing globally, how do you take that, that business case that really worked on that one plant in that example, how are you taking that innovation globally at the corporate level? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, the cynics among us could say, well, of course Diageo um, decided to build the most water and energy efficient rum distillery of its kind because they weren't paying for it in the end. The U.S. Virgin Islands was paying for it. Um, to which I retort, uh, we have two other uh, distilleries in Scotland that came before the U.S. Virgin Islands and actually um, set the stage for the, the model that we employed in St. Croix. Um, and I think uh, what, and these two distilleries, um, again, not to be a shameless brand promoter, but if you're a Johnny Walker drinker or a Tangray drinker, feel good about that as well, because those are two of the st distilleries that, um, the, the Johnny Walker actually distillery and Tangray distillery will be virtually carbon neutral. Uh, huge distilleries, the biggest um, that we have anywhere in the world. They're commissioning their bioenergy plant as we speak, and it's expected to power 90 plus percent of the distillery's energy needs, electrical and steam, um, which is pretty huge. Um, and quite frankly, that that's a 65 million pounds sterling prop, uh, project plus um, for
for which the return on investment in a classic business case is, shall we say, not ideal. Um, so I think it's well accepted within Diageo that we did that project almost entirely for the environmental reason, rather than um, a, because it was a good return on investment or <coughs> whatever. Um, so I, I think what what those three examples have done in Diageo is um, set the bar permanently high for all new builds. I don't think I know. Um, you know that that all new builds that Diageo creates in in um, any market will be at that level of um, environmental efficiency. And um, the challenge for me is to get our existing builds to catch up. Um, to the standard that the new builds have set, um, which is very, very hard and um, occupies a lot of my time. The, the work that we've done in, in these three plants is really not brand related at all, even though I speak about it as, as brands. Um, it's um, the, the production footprint of Diageo is one business unit, one entity under one individual who happens to also be the environmental champion, champion happily. Um, so his mandate has been that new builds will meet these requirements. Um, we also have set um, aggressive carbon, water, waste, and effluent targets that apply to all um, Diageo facilities worldwide. That um, is the you know attempt our attempt to bring the others up to the to the standard by which the new ones operate. So we have a um, a very uh, robust and in, in getting more robust implementation program within this, the production part of our business to drive achievement of those targets, which were, um, we're halfway through the target achievement period. They come due in, in fiscal 2015, so the heat is on uh, literally for us to, to really make some, some progress. So I would say that um, those are ad hoc one-off examples, they're indicative of the overall um, ethos that's been built into Diageo's production operations over time. The brand teams are slow to kind of buy into it. The, the production operation has been really driving the environmental program at Diageo. So challenges still to um, help the Captain Morgan brand team, for example, understand that that's a powerful marketing tool, what they have there, that the, the liquid that, that is going into their bottles is really amongst the, the best in the world. Interesting. Thank you for the clarification. Aman, so you talked about social media when you asked people whether they're using Twitter, which is one tool, about half the people raise their hands. I got the, uh, the social media bug probably about two years ago, and it can be very demanding uh, so one of the tools that I use is uh, TweetDeck, which allows me to have an automatic feed of Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as if anyone says anything about me, it comes in. I also use JustMeans.com, so if I send out something, it goes through JustMeans, as well as LinkedIn, Facebook, and all these different widgets. What would you recommend for both audiences? One, the people who are already on there, to maybe make it more productive or more useful because they're probably experiencing that same social media fatigue and what would you recommend to the folks who aren't really using it yet how it could be beneficial to their jobs? Um, I think it, since you guys are a part of Two Degrees that's already a step in the right direction. Two Degrees is a social media platform yeah. but for a very specific niche audience. Um, so for, for, the, for the few of us who are on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, I think TweetDeck is a great example. It's right on your screen. Hootsuite is another one that I find very useful. Um, there are a lot of tools, but those are the two that are the easiest to use and are sort of pro-choice. Um, the others kind of end up, you have to log on and keep them on your screen and they kind of become, make your computer or device slower. So those are the two that I refer to the most. Um, for those of us who are new to social media or thinking of coming on social media, I think a small baby step would be if, if you're unsure about the Twitter and the Facebook and how personal that is versus how professional that is, take a baby step and join one group that you're really interested in on LinkedIn um, and follow some of the conversations that go on. Um, you will slowly see the value and, and it'll give you the same sense that you can get on Twitter. You can watch without engaging. 
you can engage when you want to, and then you can step back. And that's why I think Twitter is a useful tool. On Facebook, you kind of have to commit. You have to like something before you can make a comment. Um, what if you don't, if, what if you dislike it? You still have to like it to go on their page and comment. Um, in, on Twitter, you can take either stance and then step back when you don't want, don't want to be part of the conversation. You can get access to people that you wouldn't necessarily get access um, the traditional route. So I think for people who are a little skeptical about, about social media, I would suggest LinkedIn is the best way to take care of those fears because one group on LinkedIn that you pick carefully, that is, it doesn't have to be what you do at work, it can be food or wine or anything that interests you. Um, and just be a part of it for a few days and you'll see the kind of conversation that drives it. You'll see how much value you get out of it. And then apply that formula on Twitter. Um, you know, you can keep yourself private and just be an onlooker um, and then decide. And, you know, I, I want to say one a disclaimer. I was not on Twitter or, or Facebook till a year and a half ago. Um, I was against social media. I was very about privacy and professional versus personal. But I do see the value of it now. I get to talk to people that I wouldn't otherwise. It's a great engagement tool. And so I'd say baby steps would be the way to go. Great. Thanks. So how many people are part of the Two Degrees Network here? Just about everyone. That's great. I, I, I actually put two, two Degrees Network above social media because I think it's such a vetted community of thought leaders and experts that there's more of an intimacy, and there's more of a sharing, and there's more of a common goal. I think social media still has a lot of the wild, wild west where you if put it out there. If you're strategic about it, I think, yeah. I think you can link it. But I just put it out as an example because I think that's where people are more comfortable with. We're part of a working group and we're working towards solutions mm -hmm. is the theory behind two degrees and that's why it works so well. Um, social media needs to be looked at with, this, with a similar strategic viewpoint. I think that'll make us feel better about being on it. Okay, thanks. So let's take a couple questions from the audience, and then we're going to go to the round tables. So show of hands. Right there. Show. We have a, a microphone, just so everyone can hear you. And if you could say your name, company, and then ask a question, that'd be great. Thanks, Michael. My name is Ashok Kamal, and I'm from Bennu. We're a uh, green marketing company focused on recycling. So let's say a smart sustainability consultant like Mark meets a green-hearted corporate executive like Roberta, and you create a compelling campaign around, let's say, recycling end product waste from Diageo's brands. How would you then broadcast this uh, information, Aman, using social media to then possibly create HR benefits in uh, the talent wars that are out there because and all the benefits that I read about for CSR, one of them clearly is uh, the effect on reputation in recruit. That's a ringer. You're a ringer, aren't you? They planted you. <laughs> I've never met any of these people before in my life, but I do know Michael, full disclosure. He's a, a very friend. holistic question. Thanks. Yes, Absolutely. Holistic. So you each have to answer that. Well, okay. Well, let's uh, go team. Um, <laughs> working from uh, the inside out, I guess, uh, looking at the, at the packaging, the innovation opportunities, um, it's, it's obviously a uh, uh, an assessment inventory of current packaging and structurally looking at your dematerialization what are the opportunities to do to uh, you know move the product to market with less footprint both in the product itself but also on the end of use so the end of use part of course uh, in the spirits world it's 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 glass which is a recyclable sustainable story in itself uh, there's an energy story along with that a transportation footprint we can get into the sub details of that but nonetheless um, on the net of uh, the linkage, there's a business case that, that has value, certainly. And, uh, so uh, it just you have to go through a systematic process of inventory analysis and, analy and analytics, uh, analytics to uh, assess the opportunities. And then be, I would say that as a foundation because in our experience, we've seen companies step out in front of the data and uh, therein lies the greenwash rub. Um, most importantly, um, and that's what scares most CEOs, is that they don't feel that they're ready to go to market, but they can stand behind the statements that their, their marketers are generating. And uh, so I, I would advise just generally that we were very sound in data and we can make sure that it's bulletproof generally to the marketplace, then we can craft a story that's referential to the, to the customer. Yeah, 
and I'll add to that, you know, once you have your, your data and um, you think you have a story, you can't really tell it unless people want to listen. And um, that's actually been a barrier in um, my business because um, the general feeling amongst our marketeers, um, especially here in North America, has been when someone is walking into a liquor store to buy a bottle of vodka, they're not thinking green, they're not thinking sustainability, they could care less. Um, so what's the commercial advantage to marketing Captain Morgan as, you know, liquid, you know, rum distilled in the best environmentally friendly distillery in the world? Um, and that nut we have not cracked. Um, we have some, you know, individual brand team marketeers who have an interest in it. Um, but from a um, commercial perspective, there's no pull from the marketplace in our industry today. So as far as, I think you said HR. So the reputation part is obvious to most of us. Um, and, and like Mark said, if we have strong data, that kind of flows outwards from that. The HR perspective on that, I believe, would be that if this is going to be part of everyone's job, if this is an initiative we've taken on in a partnership, and this is how we need to think of solutions and new products, and this is the model we want to use for everything in, in the future, I would take that with us as the HR team to campuses when you're recruiting. I would bring it up in the job interviews. I would bring it up before the employee becomes a part of the culture and then you have a problem because they don't fit your culture. And so you never brought it up and said sustainability is a core component of the way we think, the way we produce, the way we strategize. And it's a problem now because we can get rid of him. Um, that's the HR piece. The marketing piece, I agree with you. It's a big problem. But I do think that um, just beans for example, if you put something on there, there is enough of a crowd, of a dedicated crowd on websites like Just Means that will sift through the information and figure out how authentic it is. And if they see that the data is there and, and it's there to support it, they'll put it out on social media for you. And then they'll start talking among themselves and they'll make consensus and they'll, they'll pat you on the back and you'll get all kinds of stuff out of it. Um, but I think, again, data is a big part of it. Um, I think on, on these platforms, there's enough of a community today who cares deeply about these issues. Of course, there's the, there's the audience that say, oh God, this is all greenwash. Or at Sustainable Brands, we heard in one of the panels, Jeffrey Hollander, former CEO of Southern Generation, said something like, if your product is, is soda, who cares if it's in a plastic bottle or a glass bottle? Um, you know, so that, that's kind of the other extreme and that kind of relates to Diageo. The product in itself is something that consumers are not looking for information on related to sustainability. But I think there's enough of a community of people out there, like everyone here, that will be willing to support you to push the message out correctly, but just make sure there's enough to make it authentic. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for, for Q&A. We started a little bit late, and we really want to get to the roundtable discussions, which is you know also a big part of this event. And we also don't want to cut into our drinking time later on. <laughs> so how about a big hand uh, for our panelists? OK. Right, you have to do the work now. So, what, now, what I'm going to suggest is that we roll a bit into our drinking time, but the ones we've got going, you can allocate somebody on each table to go and get a round in. That's a, that's a compromise, isn't it? Okay, so um, I think you're all on the right tables, aren't you? I'm going to be joining table four. You all have a chair, so uh, we will run this through to about half past eight. And as I say, once you've got going, get it going first, then send somebody out to get the drinks. All right, okay, thank you.